I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. And this is the I Hate Politics Candidate Interviews with Lorianne Sales, Tom Hucker, Scott Goldberg, and Evan Glass for Montgomery County Council at Large. I'm Sunil Dasgupta, host of I Hate Politics. If you are new to the show, I Hate Politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools, and streets, and our local governments as they function in diverse, democratic, and sometimes divided societies. As part of the show, we have conversations with local, state, and sometimes federal candidates, rather than ask them how they stand on a multitude of issues these conversations try to get to the character of the candidate. The Montgomery County Council is going to have 11 members after the November 2022 general elections, up from nine previously. Of the 11, seven are elected from demarcated districts and four are elected countywide or at large. At large races resemble county executive races for the size of the district, which, mind you, is larger than any congressional district in all of the United States. The at-large seats on the Montgomery County Council represent 1.1 million county residents. No congressional district is more than a million people. There are many more people running for the four at-large county council seats than included in this episode. You can look back in the archives for interviews with social justice activist Brandy Brooks and incumbents Will Joando and Gabe Albernoz. I'll add the links on the podcast social media post available at IHP Pod. In this episode, I talk to four candidates, former Gaithersburg City Council member Lori Ann Sales, incumbent county council member and former Council President Tom Hucker, Montgomery County Democratic Party leader Scott Goldberg, and incumbent at-large county council member Evan Glass. Having four long-form interviews makes for a really long episode. The advantage is that you get a head-to-head comparison, but if you want to skip around, look in the show notes for the timestamps for each candidate. The interviews appear as I recorded them. Don't forget to listen to the previously released episodes featuring the other at-large candidates. Music for this episode comes from Emily Hall, a DC singer-songwriter who grew up in Wheaton. You can find her on Instagram at Songs by Emily Hall. Rise above All the hatred and anger that leads us astray Oh, I still believe in love today And throw out your guns And don't be confused Between what's black or white Compassion's most powerful When we unite Cause I believe in love Sweet love May the power of people Above all the hatred and anger that leads us astray Oh, I still believe in love today Laurie Ann Sales, welcome to I Hate Politics. Thank you, Sunil. I hate politics. You want to talk um, about education and the role of education, uh, in particular as it relates to um, a stronger economy, um, education is usually um, something that is handled in the county by the Board of Education, right? Where do you think the county council has a role in 
determining the quality of education that um, is delivered through public schools in Montgomery County? You know, I think our values and commitment to education are reflected in our budget, how we spend our budget, how we prioritize uh, education at the state level, the federal level, and even locally to ensure that we have the resources that are needed to um, provide our students with um, a college and career ready education when they leave our schools. Um, to facilitate the economy that is going to employ them uh, when they graduate from our schools. And so well, let me ask for a clarification here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the budget, the county budget, half of which goes to um, schools, is, is really determined, legally determined by the maintenance of uh, effort law. So I'm not sure what, how much county council really does or does not change it. I mean, they can increase it, but they can't decrease it. So what role do you think you will have as a county council member to shape actual education policy, except to say, here's some more money? Well, I think that has to do with the bully pulpit. And we advocate at the state level in support of the blueprint for education. We advocate at the federal level to ensure uh, resources are invested in workforce development programs. And so that's the power of an elected official. Right. You are going to use your bully pulpit in order to push for uh, education outcomes, but you don't really have any control over what the Board of Education decides. How can you deliver on what you promise is essentially what I'm asking. I think it also has to do with relationships, the relationships that you have with the Board of Education and um, your state delegation, um, your teachers, your PTA. Um, I think when you work in partnership and not as adversaries and you're all working towards a common goal, you can affect change and you can prioritize what's needed. I'm all about data-driven results. And so I like to point to the data to prioritize where money should go. And you can't argue with data, you know. There are certain things that you can try to do, but um, there are some elected officials who actually still testify at their board of education meetings who um, build coalitions with community members to advocate for resources at the board of education. And, you know, as an elected official at the local level, you know, they say the the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Sometimes it's the loudest group and coalition that you build that will get the response that uh, the needs demand. I don't mind. I don't mind speaking up when necessary. I don't mind building consensus with people that I don't always agree with to get the end result that's necessary. And I think you have to be willing to do that. Okay. So what is a consensus around education that you would like to see, that you would like to build? I would like to see more of our students graduate college and career ready. I would like a consensus around how we're going to um, uh, compensate our educators to um, uh, educate our students in this new environment Um, I think our educators were, um, you know, pushed to um, acclimate to a whole new learning style, develop, um, uh, you know, a variety of skills that they weren't prepared for in order to, um, you know, still educate our students during this time. And I can't imagine what our students experienced with, you know, um, uh, not being in in-person learning, um, not having the wraparound supports that in-person learning offers. We've been talking about college and career ready for, I mean, over a decade. It's not that we don't have consensus around college and career ready. There is something missing in that that is not delivering, according to you, a promise that was made. Where is the failure and how you will build 
consensus around that failure to provide a solution? I think we need to do a better job of stakeholder engagement. Um, I think uh, uh, public-private partnerships are important and key um, to facilitating a successful workforce. Uh, yes, but what is the failure? So the failure is that we don't have everyone invested in college and career readiness. We want all of our students to go to college and we have a workforce shortage. So you want a greater emphasis on career. Is that correct? I don't want to create an emphasis on career. I want to create a balance. I want to create a balance for our schools to um, increase the amount of students who are graduating uh, not just college ready, but career ready as well. Okay. What does balance look like to you? So I think balance would be every student who wants to graduate with a skill set should be able to do so. That seems to be a very generic point. I'm asking what um, you mean exactly when you say that there should be more career. What career do you want to see emphasize what kind of resources, what kind of uh, facilities or, you know, what kind of leadership, what kind of, uh, you know, ed ed instructional uh, support? Uh, where do you think that you can have that impact? So I think increasing the amount of slots for these programs. Right now, there are limitations on how many students can um, engage in the CNA program, cosmetology, school construction. What is a CNA automotive. program? I'm do I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Is. Certified nursing assistant. Okay. Like my daughter, she was able to graduate with her CNA license, certified nursing assistant and geriatric nursing assistant mm -hmm. certification where she can, she's been working all throughout her college career and she's making almost over $16 an hour. OK, so these are opportunities that all of our students should be able to have access to and not just 25 students per semester. And that all started because of a public private partnership through a private donor, one of our um, uh, uh, assisted living facilities and, you know, people who are identified in the schools to teach the curriculum. And not every school has the infrastructure to accommodate that learning environment to get the bodies for people to test blood pressure and to, um, you know, perform all of these. Correct. Uh, so we have Edison. Yes. And then we have Seneca Valley. Yes. Yes. Do you want a third school like that? Well, I think a third school um, would be nice, but I think we've learned so much during the pandemic that, um, we should start thinking um, more, um, uh, we should be thinking more, we should have more um, out of the box ideas. With technology, you can do some of this work virtually with um, AI, um, you know, artificial intelligence um, and technology. I think we can finally look at ways for our students no matter where you live, no matter where you um, uh, engage at, that you can have access to these sorts of experiences. Okay. So you want more virtual programs around career education, and um, do you do you want them to be in house to MCPS, or do you think that um, they should just get it from elsewhere and, and MCPS pay for them? No. I believe in public-private partnerships, and I think that the data shows that there are thousands of jobs that are unfilled in Montgomery County right now. And if those jobs are unfulfilled, we should be working with those employers to help fund and prepare students for those positions. While we're also preparing them for the next four-year degree, we should be preparing them for the jobs that are. Could in you say something now. about the jobs that are not filled? I mean, what types of jobs are you talking about here? I'm talking about jobs in technology, um, jobs in um, healthcare. But what, 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 what about the, which techno, which technology, which part of healthcare? It's one thing to want 
um, you know, uh, biotech uh, researchers and another thing to want somebody that puts uh, COVID tests together, right? So I, I think what what is your sense of where the where the the shortages are? So the shortages run the gamut. We have shortages in every sector, from the uh, uh, public works department to. Are you saying that those are the those are the prof- specializations that would go into public works departments? Who's going to move us around and move the economy if we don't have good roads and bridges? No, I agree with you, but but that's a different training altogether now, right? So it's n- that that is now. Mm-hmm. Uh, civil engineering uh, and construction engineering, which I think I'm absolutely right. Uh, you need more of, but that's not technology or healthcare. Um, so what I'm saying is that, you know, where do you think in, in the many things that we talk about, where do you think are the real labor shortages so that we can focus there? I don't think there's any one particular area. There are a variety of areas where the labor shortage exists. We just heard that there's a labor shortage in the education system with bus drivers and educators because they're leaving. Everyone has looked at this workforce in a whole new light since the pandemic. And so I can't um, really uh, say that there's one particular um, industry that there's a shortage in. In or, but in order to change education policy, right, we have to identify where we will make the investment. That's what I'm going towards, right? So it's what, you know, generally, edu- if you want general education, yes, they have more schools, right? But you s- said specifically that you want more career-ready people, which is okay. fine. And mm-hmm. so that then raises the question, which career-ready and, you know, uh, and where should we make the investment? That's my real question is that, you know, yes, if it's construction uh, engineering, then you invest in construction engineering. If it's in biotech, then you invest in biotech. But we have to make that identification. Well, I think the identification is how quickly can you get someone into the workforce without a four-year degree? And what does that entail? Does that involve... Um, you know, a shortage in our public safety services. And so we need more um, slots in our college, um, our Montgomery College program for police officers. Um, If the shortage is in, um, you know, maintaining our roads or, um, you know, providing bedside care to our um, aging population. I think we just have to identify where those shortages are. That's why we have an Office of Legislative Oversight with the county where they can look at the labor statistics, where they can look at the job loss and where the needs are. And every year we have a new budget and every year our Board of Education can re-identify and reprioritize which particular um, um, uh, industries need more seats. That's a high standard, really. I mean, that's a huge high standard that you're asking for for the uh, for the um, MCPS to prioritize week year to year. Because you know, if you invest, for example, in automotive engineering, that's a huge investment that is made. Now you can't shift that to construction engineering quite as easily as 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 you know from a year to year. So we have to have a little bit more sort of long duration view of where the investment ought to occur. Otherwise, we will just be, you know, flailing from year to year. So I was trying to get a sense of what you think are the more enduring areas where which we should, the school system should make um, investment. In fact, which you would help build consensus for more investment. That's what I was asking. Yeah, I think... um with a reliance on uh, virtual education, distance learning opportunities. Um, Broadband is going to be um, a huge sector that we should start preparing. Okay, that's a very good idea. Where, how do you prepare for greater broadband access? What is your view of that? So that's ensuring that everyone in Montgomery County has access to- How do you do it though? 
well, you have to build the infrastructure. How do you get the infrastructure? You prepare the workforce. How do you prepare the workforce? You train them and you educate them and you pay them. I mean, uh, we can talk about that for any of these industries. Okay. But, you know, now you're talking about a long, long tail, right? You're not going to get the, you know, if you want to prepare somebody to educate, prepare the workforce, to build the infrastructure, to build broadband, that's a, that's a huge long tail that is going to come about in many, many years. It's not a year to year um, sort of an immediate impact. It is though. Every year we graduate thousands of students. Every mm -hmm. year we have an opportunity to train students in the industries that are in demand. Every year, every year we can do that. And we have a variety of specializations as you said, at Edison in Seneca Valley, where we can alter the enrollment depending on the needs of the workforce. I don't think that is uh, um, an aspirational or something that is unimaginable. That's what we should be doing. Every year we look at our budget and every year we um, create a strategic plan that aligns with the budget. I mean, that's what we do in Gaithersburg. We're able to look at every year, every decade, we are able to reflect on that strategic plan and we have overarching uh, aspirational plans, but every year we keep trying to push the needle forward to meet those goals. And so we should be uh, setting those aspirational goals of ensuring that we are graduating and preparing the workforce of tomorrow. Okay. You, so let's go back to the broadband point. And, you know, there are lots of people um, in the county that don't have good broadband access and that affected those families uh, who had kids in the system and then they had to log in and all of that. Do you have a solution for that? Sort of, I, I understand the workforce development and get them ready, but do you have a solution specifically uh, for how to get uh, increased broadband access immediately? Well, I think that has to do with working with our providers, um, ensuring that they have the space, mm -hmm. um, the uh, space and opportunity to uh, um, implement that sort of infrastructure. Um, you know, um, the, the cell phone poles that are needed all throughout the county, the testing, the underground um, wiring that needs to be done. That's all going to take, uh, you know, anywhere from electrical workers to um, people who have to dig below the surface. I would think the immediate need is to uh, to get people that can't afford stable in uh, internet to get stable internet, and the only two ways to do it is that the county subsidizes it, or you pass a law that forces providers to, um, cro you know, to provide it free. Is there a third way or do you, is there one of these ways that are appealing to you? I've seen our providers um, create, you know, um, uh, free broadband access at community centers, libraries, um, you know, some of our schools that um, are open on the weekend. Um, you know, that's why it's so important to have community centers in our county um, to ensure that uh, we don't have students sitting in parking lots of, you know, fast food restaurants to gain access to broadband. But that's a different kind of solution, I think. It's not, I mean, I think we, I, I think the way we started was that um, students should have at broadband access at home right? Going to a community center is only feasible for a certain age, and then it needs supervision. You know, it's, it's, it's the next best probably. Um, but at, for the home piece of this, do you have a preference over, you know, whether you want to subsidize uh, those households or um, do you want to make regulatory change so that providers um, provide it on their own? I think it's... Uh... A little bit of both. 
you know, um, Comcast is able to subsidize equipment and access for low income households. We want to ensure that we have, you know, the most educated students. And so if providing students with a hot spot um, or, you know, uh, working with our federal government to ensure that we have the resources to, um, you know, uh, subsidize a cable bill to ensure that, you know, our residents all have access to it at at home. But I also, well, not even but, and we should have access to it in more public places and spaces. Eventually, we're going to get to, you know, a more connected community. But for now, I think we have to advocate for the resources and work with the providers to provide okay. affordable access to the internet. Laurie Ann Sales, thank you for coming on I Hate Politics. Good luck in the campaign. That was Laurie Ann Sales from Montgomery County Council at Large. You can find out more about her at laurieannsales.org and you can follow her on Twitter at Laurie A. Sales. Up next, incumbent county council member from District 5, Tom Hucker, now running for an at large seat. Heal our voices as we sing. Tom Hucker, welcome to I Hate Politics. Thanks so much for having me, Sunil. You wanted to talk about climate. Climate change is a global problem. What do you think the role of a local government is in climate action? Let me try to explain it in a couple different buckets. The county government itself is a big part of the local economy um, and as well as the school system. You know, I, I would include that. Um, the county government is, a, we're about to pass the $6 billion budget uh, for the year. Uh, we have tens of thousands of employees between the county government and the school system uh, and Montgomery College and, and the planning, uh, park and planning departments. And um, all that can be a powerful either, um, you know, carbon polluter if we do things the wrong way or a force for change if we do things the right way. So a lot of the time that we have spent on, uh, on carbon reduction efforts and uh, climate change mitigation efforts um, have been dealing with making the government perform better and ending some of the sources of carbon pollution that are a um, uh, result of government action. So, for example, we, we, we run, uh, um, I, and you, you know, I chair the Transportation and Environment Committee. So, I am very involved in this um, and have been for years. I've, I've been finishing my eighth year on the committee and my fourth year as chair. For example, we run one of the biggest suburban bus fleets in the nation. Um, and Right now, most of those are diesel buses, unfortunately, and so they're big polluters. We are slowly phasing them out, and each year we're buying more uh, electric buses. The county exec has been uh, supportive of that, but I will say that our, our, uh, our committee uh, has led the way with the council putting in additional money so we can buy electric buses faster and transition our fleet. Um, but you can't just do that by putting in money, you have to also stand up the charging infrastructure, right? Um, so uh, that's a big part of it as well. We've, um, the county uh, government's been doing, I think a good job at standing up the, the charging infrastructure to switch, uh, convert more of our bus fleet to electric um, and to uh, not just uh, um, be using um, electricity from coal plants, but but rather we, we've, uh, we've set up some, uh, um, some facilities that are really charged by solar energy to charge our buses, uh, which are, are, you know, is terrific and exactly the direction we need to be going in. A second bucket, bucket is really the private sector. We have very limited ability to make a residential uh, apartment building owner or a commercial building owner do that because while we can, uh, we can say they must do this in Montgomery County, the only penalty that we're allowed to charge them uh, under state law is $1,000. So, 
you know, that's not much. If you own a commercial apartment build or part, uh, office building, you're not going to make millions of dollars in retrofits. Uh, if it's not uh, cost effective, you would just rather pay a thousand dollar fine. Um, so we have passed two main major pieces of legislation just in the last six months. Um, one is a, a building energy performance standard that was sent over by the executive branch to our committee. And that does just that. It, it uh, requires uh, more buildings to disclose how much energy they're using so that the, ener- so that the government can track them um, and work with those owners to recommend uh, imp- energy efficiency improvements. Um, and it, um, it will, will start a system of regulation to require those building owners to make improvements. Um, however, as I said, we can't really make them do that uh, because our ability to find them is only $1,000. In other jurisdictions that have BEPS legislation, Building Energy Performance Standard, like St. Louis and, and like uh, New York and, and DC are about three of the only areas that are cities that have this kind of legislation, they have a much stronger fine that's in place that they can impose on building owners. We can't. Um, so what I did to make the BEPS legislation more uh, viable is I, I wrote with Council Member Friedson and, uh, and, and passed legislation that's called the Green Building uh, Now Act, which um, takes 10% of the energy tax revenue that we raise uh, each year and it uh, dedicates it to our Green Bank. The Green Bank is a public-private uh, entity set up by the county government, um, and it uh, brings in lenders to uh, help uh, building owners do deals like uh, like I'm talking about. So the nice thing is it can actually uh, multiply. Uh, it, it can leverage limited public dollars to uh, leverage a much larger private investment. So, uh, for example, in the budget we're about to pass, the county executive, uh, 10% of the, the county executive followed the law that we passed um, and dedicated $18 million, which is 10% of the energy tax revenue, to the Green Bank. The Green Bank will take that $18 million now, and they'll be able to leverage probably four to five times that from private lenders. So we're, now we're talking about 80 to $100 million that they will make available to building owners to make these energy efficient uh, improvement. Uh, let's talk about the public sector side first. Um, you said that, you know, the county government is a big part of the local economy and it can do things to become more, um, you know, climate conscious and in particular, you mentioned um, rooftop solar uh, and bus fleet, right? So it turns out that the way that the way the mark the energy efficiency market works is via tax breaks. Tax breaks make energy efficient investments possible, but as the public sector, you don't pay taxes. So it's not, if, you know, um, the break even for government buildings and government entities doesn't quite work the same way as in the private sector. Um, so I am wondering, does that explain the slow rate of rooftop solar and electric conversion of bus fleets? both in county government and in MCPS? Um, I don't think it explains it. I think there's a, uh, um, well, not a lack of commitment, but not a vigorous enough commitment to uh, make those, um, to really make that a priority. There's there's limited dollars for sure, but there's also creative financing out there um, and public uh, um um, financing and leasing uh, opportunities that we could be taking advantage of um, to do more um, rooftop solar on more county buildings. There's no question. I've been raising that issue for years, the school system as well. And, you know, I get back these complicated answers like, well, we're moving as fast as we can. We're going to replace a certain number of roofs in the next 10 years. We wouldn't want to put it on a roof that we're going to replace, um, you know, things like that. It, it doesn't ever seem like it's a top priority. Well, so why not? Is it then the case that we don't care about climate change in this county beyond, you know, sort of the county council? 
Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. And I mean, there are, if you're just talking about rooftop solar, there are rooftop solar arrays on an awful lot of county buildings um, at this point, uh, but not enough and not all of them and not enough. Progress is slow and it's in, you, largely uh, up to the executive branch and the Department of General Services. So they, they take up these projects on a sort of a building by building um, timeline. Uh, you know, and um, each one, it, it uh, you know, they, they're moving forward. I, I'm always, I always uh, feel like they can move faster than they are. But is there anything you can do on the county council? Um, well, we, you know, we, we do. Uh, we bring them in. We have oversight hearings. Uh, we, we run them through this. And uh, pretty quickly you get into, well, we can on this building because we're going to replace the roof. Or this building, um, you know, this this space we're renting. We're going to get out of this rental space, but it's not our building. Um, this building we're probably going to demolish in a few years, so we wouldn't want to put uh, panels on that. Or we're we're considering we're doing a feasibility study to uh, uh, think about you know combining this agency with this other agency or moving it into this other flex space over here. Um, so we wouldn't we wouldn't want to take action too quickly because you know things may change in the future. Yeah, but that seems like a cop out. And, you know, then it seems that the county council doesn't have any levers to move this forward. I wouldn't say we don't have any levers, but the executive branch has much more authority over it than we do, for sure. OK. All right. Let's talk about the private sector. Yeah. So you mentioned that you had this new uh, building energy um performance standard uh, bill. The state also passed building performance standard. Do you think the state preempted county action in this respect? I don't know. I mean, having looked at it, that was certainly that's the area that I probably I know the best. Um, there was no, there are different types of preemption, um, as you know, and uh, in the state bill, there was not an express preemption, meaning they did not say um, county governments cannot go beyond what we are doing here with the state, um, um, we we you know we read their legislation. We talked to our attorneys. We talked to their attorneys, um, and I talked to uh, um, you know our own uh, delegate Kumar Barve from District Seventeen, Rockville and Gaithersburg, who's the chair of the committee. And his goal was not at all to uh, preempt the county. So um, that's why it made made sense to move forward with our county bill. It is my understanding that the state bill is based on em building emissions, right? How much carbon is emitted by a building. And the county bill is based oh, yep. on energy intensity of yes. energy use. Energy usage, right. That's right. So if you have this difference, and so now buildings are, building owners are now subject to two different standards. How does that make sense? <sighs> Um, how does it make sense? I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, I think a lot of that will hopefully get worked out in the regulation. Um, my, I, my hope would be that the state would let Montgomery County regulate our buildings the way our DEP, you know, wants to regulate them based on, um, based on their energy usage. Oh, so state law will not apply to Montgomery County, you're hoping? I haven't read all the details of the state law. I mean, I read it earlier, you know, earlier in the session before it was uh, amended quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I, I generally the state's approach is to leave, you know, a lot of uh, the regulation of uh, legislation like this up to counties that are high performing counties like Montgomery County, uh, other counties, Garrett County might not be able to do the same things that Montgomery County can do. And if we have a, you know, a good DEP and we're engaged with our building sector, generally the intent of the state isn't to come in and impose a whole second tier of regulation or different regulatory approach on top of what we're doing. They want to just make sure we're doing, we're, we're achieving the, the carbon reductions that, that we intended. Well, that's what I'm, you know, that's a concern, right? Because uh, one of the things that business owners and building owners say about Montgomery County is that it's hard to do business and Montgomery County is overregulated. In this case, now we'll have two sets of regulations and it's unclear now which set of regulations will be prevailing. So well, how do you resolve the problem? Um, I'm not sure we know where, where it's headed right now. Okay.
Uh, let me ask you another question about the building energy uh, performance standards. Is So these apply to commercial buildings and multifamily units, apartments in particular. These, you know, are, and they don't uh, apply to the bulk of uh, um, buildings in the county, which are single family homes. And people that live in apartment buildings generally in Montgomery County tend to, you know, have lower incomes. Um, clearly, it's going to be that um, apartment owners that make these adjustments are going to pass the extra cost to the renters. Do you think it's fair to focus this kind of legislation on the sort of the less wealthy parts of the country, the county, and not do anything about the more wealthier single family homes dwellers? Um, well, I think it's a work in progress. And I mean, certainly not all uh, single family homeowners are wealthy, uh, you know, far from it. There are quite a few um, poor and working class, you know, uh, homeowners, but the BEPS bill is intended to, um, you know, to, to work on, to, uh, address, uh, carbon from buildings and there'll be subsequent legislation to, uh, address carbon from in individual single family homes. Do you have any specific plans for single fa- that target emissions or energy intensity in single family homes? I don't. I know DEP is working on that. I don't have a, a bill in mind right now for that. Mm. Okay. Um, let's talk about the county climate action plan. Yes. How much did the county council contribute to it? Oh, no, very little. Um, our role was to to fund it. Um, the the bill, the budget that we received from the executive branch in. 2019 didn't have any funding for the climate action plan. Um, we on the council declared a climate emergency in 2017. Then the executive branch was charged with creating this climate action plan. They, they set up those work groups. The work groups made over 800 different recommendations. And the goal was to boil them all down into a quantitative analysis to help the council as policymakers uh, know the difference between which um, you know, uh, which recommendations were going to be our top priorities in which sequence in each area, transportation, buildings, composting and, and, and uh, uh, food waste, et cetera. Um, and uh, that's not what the climate action plan did. We the first the budget we received didn't have any money for the climate action plan. Uh, we were told that, uh, well, they thought maybe they could try to do it with their current resources, which you know, was unrealistic. So I fought for $800,000 to contract with the uh, uh, same consultants that other jurisdictions had used recent, uh, nearby. And uh, um, the council, I wasn't able to get the full funding from the council. We got 400,000. And then the executive branch contracted with the contractor the, to uh, come up with the climate action plan, which was delayed. And then it was very disappointing when we got it back. Why specifically were you disappointed? Well, what we paid for was a quantitative analysis. So, um, you know, what that would mean is if you look at like the climate action plan that San Diego has or, you know, other other jurisdictions, it tells them for every uh, way you could spend a million dollars, for example, how much carbon will be reduced. And that's exactly what you need to know as a policymaker. If we have a uh, you know, $100, $100 million to spend, uh, how much do we want to spend on electric buses? How much do we want to spend on a uh, composting program? How much do we want to spend on uh, grants to building owners for new insulation or windows? Um, we need to know what's going to make the biggest difference. Where do we get our biggest bang for our buck? And um, the plan was supposed to tell us that, but it did not. When we got it back um, after the deadline, uh, if you look at it, it's sort of a, I hate to say, you know, high school level or undergraduate college level sort of, uh, uh, I don't think it would, would uh, uh, pass uh, muster in your class, Sunil. It ranks all these uh, potential reforms as 
uh, high, medium, or low, and, and actually has color codes of like red, yellow, and green. And so it says, you know, all these things are highly significant, and these other things are much less significant. Well, if I have dozens of recommendations that are highly significant, that still doesn't tell me which one is better than others and where to spend the money and how to prioritize things. Um, but that's what we got back. So in a lot of ways, it was sort of a waste of money. I felt like it was politicized um, because they also uh, did not deal with some of the most significant ways that we can reduce carbon. I mean, there's, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot that is constrained uh, by state law. We can't, I can't control at the county level how many coal plants there are in Maryland or how many nuclear plants there are or uh, how much uh, uh, the Public Service Commission requires utilities to buy uh, renewable energy. That's all controlled by state law. But um, um, what we can, what we do have a lot of control over is land use, for example. Well, there's nothing about land use in the Climate Action Plan, even though that's probably the most significant um, driver of, of uh, climate change that the count, county council and the planning board have a lot of control over. Uh, it also doesn't really mention the incinerator, which is our single biggest point source of carbon pollution. Given all of this, where, how can the county do anything serious about climate action? We can't, it seems. Well, that's a little fatalistic. Um, well, it's not fatalistic. It's how you describe the problem. It's the institutional structure. We can't do anything with the schools. The executive doesn't want to do this. The plan doesn't work. Then no, what? Well, OK, let me be more positive. So, Neil, I wouldn't say it that way. I would say um, it's all about leadership. And here, here are some things we could do tomorrow. We could close the incinerator tomorrow. That's our biggest source of carbon pollution, and it's a huge source of toxic air pollution. Uh, we take something that is generally non-toxic, which is neighborhood, you know, uh, household trash, and we incinerate it and turn it into thousands of tons of toxic ash. And then we ship that toxic ash to a largely a uh, poor uh, majority black community in Virginia. To me, that doesn't make sense. It's wrong. Uh, we should stop doing that. And we should, uh, A, get serious about source reduction uh, and B, uh, minimize minimize the, the waste we have and, and uh, send it off to a landfill, not an incinerator, because that's the worst thing we could do for the environment. Number two, yeah, we could spend more money to electrify our whole bus fleet, like right away, we could borrow more dollars to do it, we could spend more dollars to do it. Um, that, you know, that is, that is another thing we could be doing right away. You're right, we could, we could have more solar panels and more adoption uh, of, uh, um, of solar in county buildings like right now, and certainly on the, the school system and the college, no question. Um, we could be putting our, our uh, uh, empty uh, government-owned land uh, to use, generating, um, generating uh, renewable energy as well. Um, and, you know, there was legislation to open up a small portion of the ag reserve to allow property owners, not to force anybody to do anything, but just to allow property owners. I can have, I have solar panels on my house and I'm allowed to have them in my yard and so are you. The only people in all of Montgomery County that can't have solar panels on their yards are in the ag reserve. We discriminate against people in the ag reserve and we say they can't have solar panels on their own property. I put in legislation with council member Reamer to allow that uh, majority of the council did not want to do that. Um, and the county executive fought it vigorously. So I think that was the wrong decision. And I hope that that comes uh, back because we're never going to hit our uh, climate goals if we can't have community solar on some of the largest land resources that we have in Montgomery County. I was able to pass a zoning text amendment countywide that covered the entire county except the Ag Reserve to allow community solar. And just two weeks ago, we opened up the largest community solar array in the county um, up uh, in, you know, around Burtonsville um, and Spencerville. Um, and it's a beaut big, beautiful array on a church property. And they, the church is making, uh, not only, you know, doing the right thing for the climate, they have greatly lowered their, their whole electric bill now is covered by, is getting, is getting paid by the sun. So that's a great thing. More, more prop, more places should do that. Um, but, um, you know, we, we're, we're going to have to allow that in more areas of the county, including the Ag Reserve. 
It seems that there is an absence of a political coalition in support of climate action because, you know, you mentioned that m- the majority of the council did not agree with you on the solar panel and ag reserve bill, for example. Right. So do you think there is a political coalition that supports climate action in Montgomery County or not? It depends on what you're talking about. I mean, on the on the Green Buildings Now Act, because that uh, that set up a big juicy carrot for building owners uh, to use to finance their building. So I the bill I passed was supported by the Sierra Club and it was supported by the Apartment Building Owners Association. Right. Um, It was supported by business and environmentalists. And that makes me happy. That's a good bill. Right. Um, And everybody benefits from it. Um, uh, The BEPS bill was vigorously opposed by the landlord, uh, you know, interests. Um, And in a way, I was sort of surprised that they even bothered because they can't we can't even find them you know, more than a thousand dollars. So they just, they're sort of afraid of like where it's all headed. And if the state changes the law, you know, will they get bigger fines at a time that they're really, (coughs) many of them have been struggling, um, you know, with, with uh, apartment um, vacancies and other things like that. So, you know, it does seem like a little um, bit of a deck chairs on the Titanic when, you know, with your, (laughs) we can only find them thousand dollars. They don't care. We, you know, but we'll still pass the bill. Um, well, I didn't, I thought the bill was sort of hyped. Yes. I, um, I mean, there was nothing, uh, no reason to be opposed to the bill and obviously we passed it, but I didn't think it was the be all and end all because, um, ultimately, um, if we hadn't passed the green, uh, construction bill, why would a building owner ever, and we can't for that was my, my, that's my point is we don't had, didn't have the regulatory tools as per the state law to, to force them to do anything. So we had to free up the money to incentivize them to do it. Tom Hucker, thank you for coming on. I hit politics. Good luck in the campaign. All right. Thanks, Sunil. Talk to you soon. Hear our voices as we sing. That was Tom Hucker from Montgomery County Council at Large. You can find out more about him at TomHucker.com and you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Hucker. Up next, Montgomery County Democratic Party leader Scott Goldberg. All the hatred and anger that leads us astray. Scott Goldberg, welcome to I Hit Politics. Good morning, Sunil. You said you want to talk about housing. So can you describe the housing problem as you see it in Montgomery County? So we have developed about 85 percent of our developable land. So one third of our county is an ag reserve. We are going to keep that open space, which is a great thing. Uh, So there's not a whole lot more land that we can really build on. um, And a lot of it has to get creative. Uh, The county executive just sent out a a request for proposal, an RFP, to develop a lot of parking lots and a couple spaces throughout the county. I think there was 18 or 19 properties that they're trying to build on to make affordable housing. Um, So that's, I mean, that's, that's a problem. We're, we're, we're limited in where we can construct new housing. Is that the central problem? No. Uh, So when we talk about supply and affordability, on one hand, on the other hand, we also have to talk about people's income, right? So to make an exaggerated point, if you and I make a million dollars a month, to be able to pay $3,000 a month in rent or mortgage is, is pretty easy. If someone's making $40,000 a year, if we don't have $1,000 a month properties that they can rent, they are going to be rent burdened. And that is a huge issue. So jobs and economic advancement are a big part of this equation. So this is not a new problem, right? This is a problem that has existed for a certain, um, for some time. Why do you think that we don't take this problem 
as if it were a crisis? Because we're human beings and we only can see what's immediately in front of us. And I think a lot of policymakers are stably housed. So they can go out in the community and see these issues and they deal with these issues, you know, on, on the county executive and county council level in a budgetary sense. And they see it not an abstract, that's not a good word for it, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect them. It doesn't touch them, myself included. So, so I think it's just another problem of a number of problems that they're looking at solving. You were running for county council and you said you yourself did not have any housing problems. So how are you different from the others who also don't have housing problems and are expected to solve this issue? When I was 24 years old, almost by accident, I started a residential property management company. So for the last 15 years, our company takes care of mainly single family homes in Montgomery County. Uh, So single family homes, as well as condominiums and small buildings. The biggest buildings that we do are four units. How is property management concerned with the supply of housing units? Let me give you a great example. One of our clients owned a condominium in Germantown. It was $1,200 a month. So two bedroom, relatively affordable, even for people making close to the minimum wage uh, because of various policies. So on a state level uh, bankruptcy policy, And then during the pandemic, courts closing uh, and evictions and different notices to vacate being restricted, this particular resident racked up about a year and a half of rent and didn't participate in filling out the paperwork to get rental assistance, which was free through the county, uh, through funds that they got through the state and federal governments. So when this gentleman finally moved out, he owed a little over $20,000 to the property owner. And the property owner said, listen, the only thing I can do is sell the unit. I can't continue to rent it. Uh, So that's one less rental unit available in Montgomery County. So you saw the problem that a unit was taken off the rental market um, because of conditions that are COVID related, right? What is that? Well, well these, were, these were policy decisions, right? Yes, they were made during an emergency, but the government on all levels made policies that are now, we're now going, you know, post COVID and I know people are still getting sick um, and we wish them all the best. But if we're now thinking this is sort of, we're going from pandemic to endemic, uh, these policies are still having repercussions and will possibly for generations. Um, so I, I, there's something I call Noah's Ark, not the, um, you know, flood evading boat, but more Noah being naturally occurring affordable housing. And the arc of that is, is generational. So housing built 50 years ago, that might be luxury, might have been luxury then, is now affordable. So from my office in Bethesda, we look out on Battery Lane, where there is a high concentration of naturally, afford- naturally occurring affordable housing. So that what I mean by the policies that we've made in the last two years and the ones that we're making or not making today will affect our housing ecosystem decades from now. What is interesting in what you are saying to me is that the biggest way to create affordable housing is to do it through this naturally occurring process of where, you know, new houses get built, they are high priced, and over time, the value uh, goes down and they become affordable housing, right? But that's a very long-term process that provides almost no reprieve to the people that you are talking about, you know, the renter that left with $20,000 or the people that 
you know, are unable to, you know, our housing burden right now. Affordable housing, whether we're talking about zero income, whether we're talking about people making 30% of um, area median income, AMI, it needs to be heavily subsidized. And so you can do that just straight from the operational budget, just give these groups and nonprofits money. Um, we have a housing initiative fund. We have a lot of things that Montgomery County are doing. Uh, here's another solution that we do a little bit, but not a lot. It's called social housing. So the county owns large amounts of land. Religious institutions own large amounts of land. And there are lots of opportunities to build housing on land that we own. Second highest cost driver of building a building, acquiring the land. If we're getting the land for free, because it's ours already, we can put up a lot of housing for mixed income. And I want to emphasize mixed income in that projects that we build should have market rate housing, should have, you know, plus or minus a percentage of the area median income and should have low and moderate income housing in the same property. It should not be one building is market rate, one building is low to moderate income. That is not a good socioeconomic mix. Um, and I think if we're gonna be inclusive in our community uh, and say that is a value that we stand for, the model moving forward is for people living together. Do you think that the way to do this kind of policy making is case by case, project by project, or is there a broader way to do this? Because, you know, it's one thing to identify one project, say that building here is overdetermined by the fact that there's a, you know, a transit and a firehouse and amenities and all of that. And then, you know, garner, um, you know, countywide support uh, against a small group of local residents, right? That's one way to do the problem. But there's another way to do the pro uh, solve the problem, which is to act, um, you know, make policy that, uh, you know, is broader um, and, you know, brings about change at scale rather than this case by case by case by case. And everything is a doggone fight. Uh, all politics is local. So I think a one size fits all solution for a county that is urban, is suburban, is rural, is exurban, uh, has highways, has metro, has an airport. Um, and, and we can get into a little bit more on, on, you know, Thrive 2050. I think a lot of that opposition is because it's a one size fits all. Uh, but I, I, I think as, a represent, as someone who wants to represent people, uh, doing this hyper, having these hyper local conversations and educating and informing people is important. That's the tension. There's a Chevy Chase library, how you solve the problem by talking to a, you know, a locally. And then there is the Thrive uh, 2050 that tries to do this at scale, right? And so it seems like you're, what you're saying is that Thrive is a problem because it is a one-size-fits solution for the entire county. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because... And, and ironically, you know, it's, it's the update of a general plan. So by definition, it is a one size fits all. OK, um, so um, the housing problem you have said is different, uh, is variegated uh, across the county. Right. Where do you think the housing problem is most acute and where do you think the housing problem uh, is not so bad. And, you know, leave the uh, ag reserve out of this. So it doesn't exist in a vacuum. So you've got people in Germantown and Gaithersburg who need to get to job centers that are in the southern part of the county and have a lot of traffic, right? That's where more affordable housing is. And they need to get to their jobs to afford their housing. 
Um, I also like to think about it in schools and opportunity, right? So you've got the, the generalization is the W schools on the Western part of the county um, have better educational outcomes than the Eastern part of the county. Um, and it is prohibitively expensive to live in those school districts. Um, and if we're getting back to Thrive 2050 and the Wedges and Corridors plan, right? So the Wedges and Corridors plan said that the east part of the county, you know, uh, to, to loosely paraphrase, not so great. So that caused disinvestment and a lot of issues there that 70 years later we're, we're still seeing and, and hope to remedy. Um, but that's, that's kind of the problem of affordable housing. The, the affordable housing exists where other government amenities and services are lacking compared to where these super expensive are. What mechanism do you use to target that investment in the areas that you, in the specific geographical areas that you need it? So transportation for one. So we were told this bus rapid transit system, we'd get a network. It would be earth shattering, world changing, any list of adjectives, and it would have a dedicated lane. We didn't get the dedicated lane. It's just a nice bus that sits in the same. Or the network. That we all, right. Or, or the network, right? We're not, we're not going up Veers Mill. We're not on 355. I don't know when shovels are going to get in the ground. The state did get some money to expand on this network. Um, but uh, I don't think we're getting on any stops there in Rockville or Wheaton anytime soon, unfortunately. Honestly, BRT is another shiny new thing. If you just added more buses to ride on, you'd have the same uh, um, outcome. Uh, right. They're just buses that sit in traffic. So you could, you could have just added to that network until you had the funds or a plan to, to build out the entire bus rapid transit network. Or more importantly, had enough frequency that people want to ride the bus. Frequency, reliability, uh, going to where people want to go to. Where do you stand on rent stabilization in the county? Uh, I understand why people would want it. I think there are just a lot of better options uh, that, that have long-term viability. Uh, if you look in the city of Tacoma Park, so rent stabilization there, uh, they have not built a new housing or rent rental unit in something like 40 or 50 years. Yes, rents are below market, but it also tends to constrict people together. So you've got people um, in the same rung of the economic ladder, just all near each other. There's not that healthy mix that I talked about before with mixed income. Um, so that's a consequence of rent stabilization. Uh, the lack of new supply is a consequence of rent stabilization. Uh, deferred maintenance is a consequence of rent stabilization. So even to come apart with rent stabilization, the rents are going up 7.3% because of inflation. I mean, that, that's a pretty big jump. Uh, so they experience a lot of the same issues that, that market rate housing does, depending upon the broader economy. So I take that you don't support rent stabilization. I do not. Okay. Um, if in the absence of rent stabilization, what is uh, a policy that could help the, you know, the lowest um, category of, um, I, would, I don't want to say the lowest income category which you actually, I think you, you call it zero cost housing. How do you support that? So even in a rent controlled environment, um, people who have no income and probably, you know, they're getting, maybe they're getting social security disability. Um, they're on Medicare or Medicaid. Um, it just, it would need to be heavily subsidized or government owned. Right. So the federal government has funds available for that. The state government has some funds, but it's up to the counties to to kind of build it. And there are a lot of projects throughout the county that that fill that need. Um, and, and and something I support is something that social housing can. Uh, the housing actually is the 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 least concern. It's the casework 
on uh, people that might be transitioning from homelessness require. Um, they need they need people to look out for them. They need to be assisted with with life skills, uh, and and they need resources to to help them deal with everyday life: food shopping, you know, medication, you know, cleaning their own home, things like that. Okay, I I I see the point, but. What I would say is that in the absence of rent stabilization, the amount of subsidy that would be required to help um, the lowest income folks is going to be higher. Um, I would assume just because the rents would be, well, housing would cost more. How do you make it happen is my question. I mean, yeah, yeah, all of these problems I, I recognize and are these, of, these of are longstanding problems, but you know, with, just with respect to housing, how do you make it happen if you know you can't you know if 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 home prices and consequently rents are so high so we in montgomery county we've done it with veterans homelessness we're at something called functional zero functional zero is every homeless veteran that we've identified in the county is housed you know I've, some people will go into homelessness um but functional zero means we have systems and processes in place that will identify those people and then get them housed as that happens. It's, it's a process, not a moment. Uh, and that's what we're working on with, with the general population. I mean, so it's the general population bigger than the, the veteran homelessness population, but it, it's doable. I think it's just a matter of money too. Scott Goldberg, thank you for coming on I Hit Politics. Good luck in the campaign. Thank you, Sunil. It's great to be here. Feel pain, still love you the same when you push love away. Still love you the same, come sunshine or rain. Still love you the same, I still love you the same. I still love you. That was Scott Goldberg from Montgomery County Council at Large. You can find out more about him at votescott.org and you can follow him on Twitter at Goldberg in MD. Up next, incumbent at large county council member Evan Glass. Heal our voices as we sing. Hear our voices as we sing. Heal our voices as we sing. Evan Glass, welcome to I Hit Politics. Good to be here, Sunil. You wanted to talk about transportation in the county? You've been the um, representative of the county to the Metropolitan Government Transportation Planning Board. The Transportation Planning Board sets priorities for the Washington, D.C. region in transportation. Those are regional priorities. And Montgomery County and other jurisdictions have to perform, have to do certain things in order to achieve those goals. Where do you think we stand on the key priorities of the Transportation Planning Board in the county? So I think the D.C. region as a whole recognizes the importance of public transportation. So we have a lot of conversations about the interconnectedness of our buses and of the metro system and of uh, biking trails and walkability. And those are a lot of projects, particularly the walkability and the bike trails that Transportation Planning Board funds. And we, we fund it through a grant process throughout, throughout the region. Uh, but there is uh, an ad hoc style here in which we are a unique community. We have the state of Maryland, the state of Virginia, the District of Columbia, and then all the jurisdictions therein. And to try and compile one overarching uh, plan uh, is hard, right? And I think that's actually what, what has made the management of WMATA and the metro system so troublesome, that you have three very different leaders who are trying to force their will, if you will, um, over this uh, interstate compact, essentially. And so uh, from, from my perspective, we're doing a good job. 
And one of the things that I'm, I'm extremely proud of on the Transportation Planning Board was uh, last year, I pushed through a resolution that said, any project in the D.C. region that needs to get funding from the federal government and needs to come before the Transportation Planning Board, they need to uh, uh, they need to undergo stronger environmental uh, reporting. And we need to see how those projects would impact our environment and particularly our air quality, which is the, the main measure to to gauge environmental friendliness for any of these projects. And it passed. It didn't pass unanimously. There were some jurisdictions who are quite content with the status quo and don't think that we need to protect our environment and, and try to mitigate the climate crisis, but it overwhelmingly passed. And so what this means is in the coming uh, two to three years, all the projects that come before this board will be measured for their environmental impact. So I'm uh, proud to have put that forward and, and hopefully we'll, we'll start seeing, seeing some things change. Okay. You mentioned 270 and the controversy about that. And, you know, there was some uh, earlier, the Transportation Planning Board had uh, deprioritized the 270 um, widening project that uh, Governor Hogan uh, proposed, but then eventually the Transportation uh, Planning Board reprioritized it. What happened? Well, the county executive, Mark Elrich, uh, made a motion at the first meeting to deprioritize, basically defund the toll lane project. And this was news to most of the jurisdictions. Uh, it was even news to me. I had not been given a heads up that this was coming. And so when made, uh, when left to make a, a snap decision, uh, nearly by a two to one margin, the jurisdictions opposed the plan. But then uh, Governor Hogan and those who supported it spent the next month lobbying. And they not only lobbied enough of the jurisdictions around the, the county, around the region, they lobbied the county council. And uh, five members of the county council decided that they wanted to support this project and re required their representative on the Transportation Planning Board, their vote on the Transportation Planning Board to reflect that majority support. And then by a two to one margin, the region's transportation leaders uh, voted in support of the toll lane project. So I believe Governor Hogan offered Montgomery County a carrot to change its vote and support the 270 widening project. As it was conveyed to me at the time, the state, in exchange for supporting this project, was willing to provide up to six, at the time, provide up to $60 million for a transit project somewhere in Montgomery County, a project of our choosing. And I thought, okay, right, we, we need more transit projects, whether it's bus rapid transit or the Corridor City Transit Way, um, something that services up county. I am totally in support of, but, but the reality is $60 million is a drop in the bucket. It doesn't even get you through the planning process. And so to, to agree to the toll lane project in exchange for what would amount to a small percentage of the, of the planning and no dollars for the actual building, I did not think was a good deal for the taxpayers and residents of Montgomery County. So did the $60 million come through in the, in the budget, the state budget? Uh, it has not arrived as of yet. And with a gubernatorial election at hand, uh, the next governor, whomever that person might be, can, can change that deal as well. Okay. All right. So tell me, you know, 270 is a problem. 495 congestion is a problem. What is your thinking about how to solve those problems, quite apart from what, um, you know, Governor Hogan has promised or not or done or not? What is your thinking of how these problems should be solved? Well, so I appreciate the question. There's a few different ways to think about it. First and foremost, that I have you know, been in favor of having reversible lanes on 270. It is very possible to add capacity on 270 within the right of way, not having to expand it much more than it already is. It's just reconfiguring it and doing so 
in recognition of the, the AM and PM traffic flow, right? So there's one way to do that. The other problem I have, and this gets down to a basic fundamental uh, governmental difference of opinion with the governor. I have a problem with taking public property, our lanes on these highways, and taking them from the public, then giving them to an international corporation who will then charge our residents to use those lanes. It's a fundamental difference, right? I think this would have been a much different conversation if the governor had said that the state of Maryland was going to build this project, just like the state of Maryland built the Bay Bridge, right? And, and the tunnel in Baltimore. But that wasn't what the governor did. And so for, for these various reasons, I had concerns. The government in, has never built actually built, physically built roads, or the interstate was built by private companies paid by the government, right? So there has always been private sector involvement in the construction of infrastructure projects in the United States. The Purple Line project uh, and the 495 to 70 proposals had offered a different kind of more um, robust or more um, expanded private partnership, including uh, private equity partnership, which is different, I think, from the uh, pr prior model, which is, you know, the construction companies get paid to construct, physically construct, right? So can you draw some lessons from the failures of the Purple Line as to what is it that in that model that did not work and that you find distasteful? Yeah, I think sometimes the problem is when we enter into these big projects, and I think this is very similar to the case of what's happening with the, the toll road program. In order to get a project passed, the executive or the company that's bidding on something might lowball an offer and make it seem much more palatable. And then in reality, as they are building the project, they run into financial difficulties because the price tag that was originally shared might not be the real price tag to build the project. And I suspect that's what happened with the Purple Line. And I suspect that is what's happening with the toll road project, which is why there's a lawsuit. Yeah, we, we have the former Maryland State Attorney General who is representing one of the losing bidders saying that the winning bid lowballed their offer. And it can't be built for that. And so the whole contract needs to be rebid. It needs to be invalidated. And I think, I think that is where we're at right now. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that uh, Governor Hogan has pushed for a toll lane project rather than public transit project uh, to relieve congestion uh, on 270 and, and 495 is because Transurban, which runs the toll lanes in Virginia side of 495, has an agreement with the state of Virginia that there will not be a, tra a, a rail line that come, you know, that competes with the toll lanes. And therefore, there is not a possibility of adding transit further along to connect, for example, Purple Line across over American Legion Bridge to Virginia. And so that's a sort of a regional transportation problem, if you will, right? So is that a topic of discussion? No, so you are correct. And these, these inter-jurisdictional regional conversations get, get, get sometimes confusing, sometimes contentious. We talk about these things, we raise them. They are not materially germane to the vote itself. This is a very technical board. And what other jurisdictions will say is we are not litigating the specifics of a particular project. It, this is one component of a regional transportation network. And they will say that the Transportation Planning Board is giving a green light to support funding for it. But then all of those intricacies, the details of it are left up to that jurisdiction or to that contract specifically. Uh, you know, when we approve things for bike, bike lanes and for uh, other trail networks on the Transportation Planning Board, we don't get into the specifics of how wide those roads are 
or how uh, accommodating they might be to oncoming traffic. That's left up to the jurisdiction who is being given the money to create that program. And so we can continue raising these concerns, asking the questions, but ultimately it's the other jurisdictions making their own calculated decision to support it or not. Okay. So how is it possible to develop a transit option across American Legion Bridge if you don't, if there is no discussion about it on the Transportation Planning Board or what can be done is essentially what I'm asking. No. So, so, so Sunil, we've had these conversations. What you're expressing is frustration and my shared frustration that the newly rebuilt American Legion Bridge will not have that option, but the votes have been cast. A majority of this council, a majority of regional jurisdictions have signaled their support for it. And you need to ask those lawmakers in those jurisdictions why they went along with the deal that did not include something that you and I both think are really important, like public transit or capacity to have some light rail over the American Legion Bridge. It seems simple enough. So water under the bridge, we can't do anything about it at this point. Well said. Well, I I wouldn't say nothing. We can't do anything about it right now. I appreciated the pun, but, you know, we do have a gubernatorial election coming up. We do have uh, local elections coming up and this issue isn't going away. It isn't going away, but I'm also not seeing any particular levers (laughs) that a Democratic governor might be able to pull in order to make that happen, based on what you're telling me. My understanding is that the next governor could terminate the contract. There might be some penalty clauses built into that contract, but the next governor has incredible uh, sway over, over, this, over this project, undeniably. There is much talk about uh, the bus rapid transit. There is one line on Colesville Road um, and return to 29. Uh, the BRT, as it's called, was supposed to have dedicated lanes. It doesn't. The BRT, as it's called, also also supposed to have a network, and it doesn't. Given the political difficulties in uh, you know, being able to get dedicated lanes where you need them, right? that is in the southern part of the county, why not just add more buses to ride on and be and, and do it that way? I mean, what is this thing about BRD? So bus rapid transit, in order for it to be effective, it needs to be rapid. And that has is what has eluded us up until this point because there hasn't been any dedicated lanes. And otherwise, you just have a series of buses, regardless of how many buses you're talking about, sitting in traffic. And going bumper to bumper, just like every other vehicle. You know, I, I've traveled to, to other cities around the country and around this, the, the, the world, and I've seen true bus rapid transit. And if you want to be able to get people from point A to point B uh, in a speedier way, that lane needs to be dedicated for the buses. Right. It's a theoretical proposition in Montgomery County and in Southern Silver, you know, in Southern Silver Spring in particular now, because, you know, you're, it's, it doesn't seem politically viable that we will get dedicated lanes. Well, let, me ask, you, well, let me ask you, why do you think it's not politically viable? We've been trying for a bunch of years. And so what's, what's, what's been the backup? You're running for office. Let me know. The reason is decisions weren't made. Tough decisions weren't made to put in dedicated lanes. You're absolutely correct. But who was supposed to have made the tough decision? Well, and and so this predates me getting onto the council, but I advocated for bus rapid transit dedicated lanes. And since I've been on the council, I've been asking our Department of Transportation how to make it possible. And as someone who lives uh, in the Four Corners area, right around the Beltway in Silver Spring, um, I know where the lanes start getting tricky and where you have to make some tough decisions. But uh, clearly, uh, the executive department has decided not to, to, to do this. 
Uh, I have repeatedly at council sessions and committee sessions asked for the information and asked for uh, a fresh look at doing more lanes or some, some third way of moving forward. Uh, and it has been met with resistance and ignoring uh, requests. And so, and here we are. And I know that, you know, the county executive has said uh, quite honestly that he had, this was his idea, you know, 15, 16, however many years ago. Well, let's, let's get this built as originally envisioned. Let's have the bus rapid transit lanes on Colesville, and then we can create that network up Veers Mill and up 355, because this is not just about, this is not just about traffic. It's also about transit equity, because we have people who can't afford to live closer to the metro, people who cannot afford to live closer to their job, and they are on the bus and they're stuck in traffic and they have no other options. So for them, let's build bus rapid transit lanes, dedicated lanes to help them out too. All right. Could you speak more specifically to what tough decisions had to be made, but were not made? So once you get north of the Beltway, uh, their Route 29 is, is, is a, a, a tough, narrow road with a number of lanes going northbound and southbound. And there are homes that buttress right up against the road. And the decision and calculation was how much of someone's sidewalk or how much of someone's uh, front lawn needs to be taken. And I think the calculation was that none should be taken. And so here we are. So that's what I mean, is that it seems politically unfeasible to have those lanes. So the promise of bus rapid transit, the dedicated lanes part of it, the most important part of it, is an unfulfilled and cannot be fulfilled. I have been on this council for nearly four years. And from my position, I have been asking why this has not been done. And I have, from this Department of Transportation, have not been given satisfactory answers. And I'll continue pushing and whether or not it is out of reach for Route 29, because this project is so far down the road, um, it has to be done when we look at 355 and when we look at Beers Mill Road. So I'm not going to give up on this prospect uh, because we, we got to get it done. I mean, is it true, really possible, honestly? Or, should we, or can it be done? If it could be done politically, it would be done. It has, it's not. Well, so you're specifically speaking about Colesville Road and Route 29. And the die might have been cast there, right? The project might have been, uh, might, might be so far near completion that it might be irreversible. That might be true. I'm not giving up, but it might be true. But as we start this project in other parts of the county, I'm going to continue fighting for it because it's the right thing to do. It does seem like a lot of wasted money, given, you know, the fact that the dedicated lanes did not come about. It seems to be a much cheaper, faster, quicker thing to do is to add more frequency to ride on. And if, if you know, as things develop, do that. Instead, what happened was that money got put, got put into BRT and, you know, ride on fleet has, you know, is still about the same. Well, the right on fleet is about to be reimagined. We are undertaking a reimagining study, recognizing that most of the routes haven't fundamentally changed in a very long time, despite population centers, despite job centers having shifted. And we, we need to rethink some of these routes and, and get people better access. So that's part of the mix right now, too. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying is that reimagination, that rethinking of right on did not happen because resources got taken away by a BRT that promised dedicated lanes but couldn't deliver. I, I think that might be a false equivalency since the, since the bus rapid transit project was mostly a capital investment and using uh, the, the, the using a different set of funding 
to build that infrastructure. The rest of the write-on fleet and the day-to-day operations is part of our operational budget. And no, so but that, if you buy more ride-on buses, that's a capital spending, right? Uh, that would be correct. Sure. Correct. So I'm saying buy more ride-on buses instead of spending all this capital money on, um, you know, on, on a BRT that couldn't deliver the fundamental part of it, which is the dedicated lanes. So you're ready to give up on BRT for 355 and Drismel Road? I think it's not politically feasible. I don't think there is any political coalition that exists to make that happen. That's, I think, in part because not a lot of people who are in political power or engaged in the process take the bus. I agree with you. I agree with you. But that's what I'm saying is that that's why it's not politically feasible. So and and there is and I don't see any prospect of it. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether this emphasis on the BRT is, you know, just, you know, a uh, call of Cersei. No, but I'm not willing to give up on it. And, you know, as we look at East County specifically and look at the prospect of Viva White Oak and building a real life sciences community around the FDA headquarters and making sure that there's a true revitalization of Burtonsville, all of that has to come with an understanding of improved public transportation. Because we bring more jobs, bring, bring more people to that area, we cannot expect them or the current residents along Colesville Road to, to experience the traffic that is currently there. And so we, we need BRT to be a partner of, of that growth and revitalization. Evan Glass, thank you for coming on I Hate Politics. Good luck in the campaign. Thank you, Sunil. That was Evan Glass from Montgomery County Council at large. You can find out more about him at evanglass.com and you can follow him on Twitter at Evan M. Glass. That's all for this episode. Music for this episode comes from DC singer-songwriter Emily Hall. I hope you'll listen, like, and share the show as we bring you stories about politics close to you and to your home. See you next time. Joy, not witness deep suffering Felt so numb I just want to stand still of love